Marcel tightened the last ropes of his hiking backpack. He stepped back, admiring how carefully he was putting the bag away. Every year he and a group of friends went on three-day expeditions to the mountains, and this year he could not wait. The fresh air, the peaceful sunrises, and the morning dew always evoked a feeling of calm in Marcel. It was his temporary escape from reality. The endless lectures and the nerve-wracking exams. That's it, Marcel mumbled after throwing the backpack on his back. Surely the next morning, Marcel and the rest of the expedition met at the main railway station in Prague. Mako, you still haven't bought a new backpack. Your back will thank you, Julie teased. Am I the last? Marcel ignored Julie's question. Julie, Chenda, Annetta and Marcel had known each other since high school. All were now students, but the tradition of the annual trip had continued. This year, the group was heading to the Eagle Mountains, first by train, but from Vampirk only on foot. Next time, you'll pull the tarps, Chenda grumbled gruffly when the group arrived at the shelter where they planned to spend the night. Chenda doesn't talk much, but when it comes to complaining, he never shuts up, as Julie would say. Sometimes Marcel wondered why he even went hiking with them every year and kept annoying the whole group with his sullen remarks. They found themselves at a shingle arrangement where travelers normally only take a break and continue their walk. The sun was slowly sinking behind the horizon. Annetta and Marcel were setting up the tarps under the shelter when they heard Julie's startled. What are you shouting about? said Chenda. Julie stood there, stunned. We... I think I saw someone there, she stammered, raising her index finger towards the deep woods. Annetta rolled her eyes. She collapsed on the tarpaulin and looked at the screen of her mobile phone. Maybe it was a leprechaun, Chenda remarked, laughing at his joke. There is no signal. Annetta sighed, slipping her phone into her backpack and slipping into her sleeping bag. Come on, let's go to sleep. Annette has already kicked the bag, Marcel said. Julie was always looking between the spruces, as if she expected something to emerge from the darkness at any moment. The nightmares had been bothering Marcel for a long time, which is why he never slept much. On top of that, it was cold and fog was spreading around the makeshift campsite. He stretched out and awkwardly pulled himself out of his sleeping bag. Julie's sleeping bag was empty and the rest of the expedition was still sleeping. He took a bun out of the backpack, spread melted cheese on it, and sat down on a bench under the shelter. Chenda woke up a few minutes later and sat down next to Marcel. Where's Julie? Chenda asked absent-mindedly. She had to go to the bathroom. I don't know, Marcel threw up his hands. When Annetta got up, the group got nervous. Come on, try to call her Chenda Annetta, urged. How am I supposed to do this if there's no signal, genius? They waited another hour. Julie was still missing. Maybe we should go to the police, Annetta finally suggested. None of the boys had a better idea, so they packed up the campsite and headed back to the city. The omnipresent fog enveloped the landscape so that they could barely see a step. Everyone was silent. They thought about what could have happened to Julie, and scenarios of different levels of credibility formed in their heads. Shit, Chenda broke the silence as he tripped over a wooden bench. When I don't believe it, Annetta breathed. They found themselves at the wooden structure the group had used as a shelter from the elements last night. Geez, we're back where we came from. Marshall said out loud what everyone had figured out by then. We'll never get to the police station like this. Let's make a line and search the woods around here, Annetta decided. They took off their backpacks, kept only their flashlights, and set off into the depths of the forest a little after dark. Julie woke up. Her head was pounding, she could see twinkles in front of her eyes and wanted to vomit. She found herself lying on the floor in a dim hall. Only a single torch was installed on the concrete wall giving Julie a sense of where she was. A cellar, the dampness, and rats in the corner of the room told her. Tears welled up in her eyes, she felt a need to scream, but the rag in her mouth prevented it. She tried standing up, but the ropes on her legs and arms wouldn't let her. This is just a nightmare. Nothing more, Julie tried to convince herself. Panic clouded her thinking. Her heart was pumping fast and loud. Julie screamed through the gag, trying desperately to cry for help, but her howling was soon cut off by a voice. A voice barely audible, unnatural, whose almost childlike tone sent shivers down her spine. I'm going to make you beautiful. 
a figure appeared before Julie. It was of average height with messy brown greasy hair, a gray hoodie and jeans. A white porcelain mask adorned with pouty red lips and red painted cheeks gave the man or woman a disturbing impression the person's eyes could not be seen. Julie tried in vain to make out the pupils, but all she saw was endless darkness. It watched Julie admiring her like a work of art, while the girl struggled desperately with the ropes. It took a pair of scissors from a small tool table, snipped idly in the air a couple of times, and began to cut Julie's hair as the girl cried and screamed. She tried to resist, but soon her scalp was naked. It pulled a small tube out of their jeans pocket. It spattered lipstick inexpertly across Julie's lips and cheeks so that the girl's face resembled the porcelain mask the mysterious kidnapper wore. Suddenly the creature turned sharply as if it had heard something. From its crouch it stood on both feet and walked away. Meanwhile, the trio has started falling into despair. There's no point in this, Chenda said resignedly. They had been combing the forest all night and still no sign of Julie. Is that, is that a church? Annetta asked rhetorically when she saw the ruin of what had once been a place of worship. In the middle of the forest, a white plastered structure rose majestically through the trees, creating a sharp contrast with the ubiquitous timber encircling the building like a royal guard protects their monarch. Something felt off. Eerie, Annetta, Chenda, and Marcel silently approached the moldy wooden door. Let's check it out, shall we? Marcel didn't even wait for an answer and walked right in where flashlights revealed a crimson moth-eaten carpet, occasionally accompanied by amber pews alongside. A golden altar at the end of the rug dominated the room. A church like any other, they all thought, until they took a good look at the huge paintings that adorned the walls of the nave. I remember the paintings. My grandmother used to take me to church services, Anita explained. But they certainly didn't have these masks on them. As soon as Annetta finished speaking, both boys realized what was special about the paintings. All the saints had their faces covered with white porcelain masks. Hearing human voices from afar, Julie screamed as loud as the gag in her mouth would allow. She let out a wild, guttural wail, hoping that her desperate cries for help would be heard by someone, anyone. Do you hear that? Marcel asked the others, not expecting an answer. Immediately, he ran to the rusty metal hatch he noticed in the corner of the room. He opened it. Stone steps appeared before his eyes. He didn't hesitate a second and climbed inside. Annetta looked at Chenda uncertainly. He merely shrugged his shoulders and so she followed Marcel. Chenda had already stepped one foot inside when he noticed movement. He turned slowly and directly behind him there it was. I'll make you beautiful. Marcel jumped off the last step and thoroughly scanned the dungeon with his flashlight. The room was empty, musty, and full of rodents running from the light. In the corner of the cellar, he discovered a kind of workbench, and next to it, Julie, Marcel asked uncertainly. The bald woman in robes with the grotesque maquillage on her face only answered by shouting unintelligibly into the rag stuck in her mouth. Marcel and Annetta slowly freed Julie from the ropes. We must get away before he before it comes back, Julie blurted out as soon as Marcel untied the piece of cloth. Where did Chenda go? Annetta realized. Shit, Marcel muttered and rushed up the stairs. It was too late. Chenda's dead body lay on the floor. His eyes stared absently at the ground, lying limp on the tiled floor, scissors embedded between his shoulder blades. Fuck, 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 Marcel yelled. It's not fucking true. Water welled up in his eyes. He wanted to scream, to curse. The girls burst into tears, desperate tears and utter shock. They knew there was no escape. They would find nothing but damnation in this God-forsaken, bizarre place. The trio sobbed over their deceased friend until Annetta noticed a figure standing at the entrance. I'll make you all beautiful, the masked stranger expelled in its disgusting, almost childlike tone of voice. Annetta, Julie and Marcel panicked, instinctively rushing to the windows on the other side of the church, terror in their eyes. Marcel jumped through the broken window, followed by Julie and son of a Annetta cursed after she vaulted over the windowsill. She tried to stand up, but instead she hissed like trapped prey. I think I broke my leg, Annetta sobbed. The creature with the porcelain mask approached the window.
Marcel and Julie looked at each other. They didn't have to say a word. They both knew it was too late. They made their escape. Where the fuck are you going? Help me. Please, please help me. Annetta choked in her desperation. Marcel and Julie ignored the cries that echoed throughout the woods and kept running until the screaming abruptly ceased. Marcel and Julie sprinted as fast as they could. They pushed their way through the never-ending thick fog occasionally interrupted by skinny trees. They stopped at a clearing. The trees were no longer growing and instead, a wide plain spread out in front of the pair. Both Julie and Marcel stopped in disgusted amazement. This is hell, Marcel whispered. The clearing was filled with crosses as far as mortal eyes could see, large wooden crosses, and on them bodies, each of them naked, hairless. Each lifeless, crucified corpse had its face painted red across its lips and cheeks. That's what, why, Marcel stammered without taking his eyes off the gruesome scene for a second. He was in such a trance that he didn't even notice the white porcelain mask slowly stalking up on him from behind. By pure instinct, Julie grabbed a large rock she found on the ground and threw it with all her strength. The creature slumped to the ground. Cautiously, she approached the mysterious kidnapper. She examined him, the masked killer who had murdered two of her friends only moments before. He lay there motionless as if all the strength had drained from him. Curiosity overcame Julie and she removed the outlandish mask. Beneath it, she found a reasonably average face. A man in his early thirties, she sensed an inviting warmth when she picked up the mask in her hand, arousing an uncanny desire. She put on the mask, all of a sudden Julie understood. All the pieces of the puzzle connected and she finally knew. It made sense to her. She realized what beauty is. See, what kind of pig can do something so horrible? Marcel asked, still oblivious to his surroundings, shivering in raw horror. Julie walked over to him. She stood by his side, silent for a moment. Can't you see how beautiful they are? I'll make you beautiful too. Did you get it? Tommy asked, his eyes bulging with excitement. Michael looked between his two friends, a smug smile spread across his face. You didn't get it, Andy said, ever doubtful. No way you got it. Shut up. Mikey wouldn't lie, Tommy barked, his tongue lisping on the word shut. Andy pushed Tommy's shoulder. You shut up, brace face. Screw you, jerk. Tommy pushed back. Soon the two boys found themselves grabbing at each other's shoulders. They wrestled around in Michael's bedroom, bumping into a dresser lined with toys on the top. Michael watched as a Lego Mandalorian ship that took him and his dad a whole week to build almost came clattering to the ground. Guys, Michael said forcefully. Mom said if you two can't keep your cool anymore, then you won't be able to come over again. Andy had Tommy in a headlock about to give his bright yellow hair a hard noogie, but the seriousness of Michael's voice caused him to let Tommy go. Sorry, Michael, they said, their eyes staring at the floor. Michael couldn't hold a serious expression for long. I got it. Bringing his hands from behind his back, he revealed a large book. The book was bound in black leather with a blank cover. Its pages were weathered and yellow as old books sometimes become. Michael felt the weight of it, heavier than the Bibles they had at church. It gave off a musky smell, like that of an old antique shop his mom sometimes dragged him to. An oily residue came off it and clung to his fingers as though he were holding a dirty rag. Whoa, Tommy said, his jaw almost hitting the floor in excitement. How did you get it? it saved up for five months, allowance and birthday money. The book had not been cheap, a price of $375, shocking the boys when they first heard it. They had been able to negotiate down to $325, something they were proud of, still too large for any of them to spend when there were video games to buy and movies to watch. Yet Michael had persisted, being the most curious of the three when it came to their foray into the supernatural the past year. Ever since he had started watching those Ghost Hunter channels on YouTube, all he ever wanted was to find something truly paranormal. When the shopkeeper, a Mr. Hupp, told them what the book could do, detailing strict instructions on contacting the other side and casting spells, Michael found his curiosity peak. This book contains wisdom and knowledge of the ancient Sumerian mystics, Babylon devil worshipper, as well as countless other cultures that are now lost to us from around the world. 
And now I have the luxury of deciding who receives it next, Mr. Huppet had said, his handlebar mustache curling with his smile. Michael wasn't sure what a Sumerian mystic was or even who Babylon was, but he knew one thing. He and his friends were going to get that book. He also knew that Andy would never try to save for the book. He had treated the whole thing as more of a novelty, like a hobby to engage in and throw away when bored. Tommy, well, Tommy just liked to be a part of things. Whatever Michael was interested in, he would generally follow along happy enough, but perhaps not fully understanding. It was solely up to himself. Have you read it yet? Tommy asked. I was waiting for it tonight, so we all could do it. This was partly true, but what was also true was that he had been a little nervous ever since buying it. Mr. Hupp had been more serious than previous times, like when they bought an Ouija board, or those candles that could summon the dead, neither of which did anything. He was always so willing to sell to the junior Ghostbusters, as he liked to call them, but this time he seemed hesitant. It took a little egging on the part of Michael to convince him to sell it. All right, but you must take this seriously and patiently. This is a significant book. Not many like it, he had said, stuffing Michael's money into his antique register. Buying the book was one thing. Hiding it from his parents was another, fearing questions of cost and reasons for buying it. He stuffed the book away, deep in his clothes dresser. It would be a month after he bought it until he'd be able to show it to his friends. The old time, it was like he could hear the book calling out to him in excitement from the bottom of his underwear drawer, pleading with him to open it and read it. But he had stood strong, knowing he wanted to share the experience with his friend. What better place than the slumber party to celebrate their graduation from grade five? Now that the time had come, the excitement tingled through his fingers as though the book was humming. He even saw looks of excitement on his friends' faces. Andy's large brown eyes hadn't left the book since he saw it. Let me read it, Tommy spit out. You're not going to hold it, shit breath. You'll drool over it with that thing in your mouth, Andy said. Shut up, Andy. You probably won't even need braces. The doctor will have to cover up your face with a bag cause of how ugly you are. Michael rolled his eyes. Guys, this is my book. I'm going to read it first. The two stopped their name calling each other. Excitement over the book trumped any desire to one-up the other over insults. Michael walked over to his bedroom window. The sun was still high in the sky, bathing his room. Outside neighborhood kids biked up and down the peaceful suburban streets. He shut the window, quieting the outdoor noise and closed the colorful blinds to block the sun. He placed the book on the carpeted floor. The three sat around it, forming a circle. Michael lifted the leather covering to the center of the book, revealing an unreadable text to their eyes. There were no words, just images that looked like they belonged in a geometry class. A Michael, it was similar to those hieroglyphs he learned about in history class. What's it say? Andy asked. I don't know, Michael said. Well, what good is a book we can't even read? He ignored this indignant comment and continued flipping. He flipped through the pages and found nothing he could discern. Come on, Mikey, how do we read it? Tommy asked. I don't know, he said again, this time more curtly. A knot started to form in his stomach. All the excitement and hope they had for this night was fading before they even began. If that happened, the guys might not want to do any more paranormal stuff again, let alone the money that he would have wasted on the book that he could have bought a new iPhone. He flipped through the pages again. There was something off about the front of the book. The very first page had a weight to it, not like the others. He opened up to the front and saw the reason for the difference. A small hole in the center of the first page contained a silver shape. The shape appeared to be three circles overlapping in the center. The middle of it imprinted into the book, leaving space for something to fit. He ran his finger across the metallic circles. It showed no rust and had a clear shine to it. He put his index finger into the small pore of the book, fitting it perfectly. As soon as he did, a sharp sting attacked Michael's finger as though the book had bitten. Ouch, he reeled his finger back, nursing it in his other hand. What happened? asked Andy. I don't know. I think I cut myself on that metal piece. A small trickle of blood started leaking from his finger. It had already stained the book's pages, while a small pool of blood filled the metallic rings. 
Looks like the only spell you're gonna get from this book is a spell on how to get a disease, Andy said, chuckling. He didn't respond, his eyes fixated on the book. The blood in the center had disappeared, as though it had drained into the book's pages like someone pulling a water plug in a bathtub. As the blood disappeared, the pages turned from old yellow to dull. Whoa, the boy said in unison. That wasn't the end of the astonishment. As Michael glanced through the pages of the book again, he noticed new letters had started to appear. What looked to be English words, or close enough to make out some sounds. No discernible phrases, as far as Michael could tell, yet close to something he could recognize. The boys were silent, their faces mashed with excitement, interest, and a little fear. You gonna read it, Mikey? Tommy asked. Do before you do, Andy said, getting up. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and scrolled through it. He placed it down and spooky music started to play through its speaker. Similar to those old black and white horror movies, Michael's dad sometimes made him watch. Sorry, gotta get the vibe right, or the ghost won't come, he said, reclaiming his spot. This was a common thing for him to do. Doing this seemed to help Andy distance himself from their supernatural exploits, as though he wasn't fully a part of it and was only along for a joke. While there remained no eligible words in the main body, the titles produced something different. At the top of every page, in bright red color, was the name of several different spells. He skimmed through, reading them out loud as he did. Summon a dead relative, enter the dreamlands, swap consciousness, animal or human, summoning and binding to an elder god. Oh, that one, that one, Tommy said, tapping the page. We could bind an elder god to our will, whatever those are. That sounds awesome, Andy concurred. Michael, happy the two weren't arguing about it, agreed. Okay, let's do it, he said as he first read over the words in his head, then began speaking. The words came out harsh and clunky, each syllable like an animalistic noise rather than anything comprehensible. As he continued, though, the rhythm of his words started to blend and form into one another. While he didn't understand their meaning, he could utter it with increasing confidence, using Andy's music to help his cadence. That made it even more jarring when the song ended midway through the page and started playing an ad for some game. Sorry, Andy said as he bolted to his phone. He turned it off and rejoined them. Michael shot him a dirty look but continued, or at least tried to. He uttered a few more words until his front door suddenly opened. Michael and Andy gasped, while Tommy let out a scream. Michael was sure, just for a second, that some horrid monster would come through, perhaps a shadow creature or even a witch. Mom says, you little shits are being too noisy, said the shape of his older sister, leaning on the doorframe. Says I can dump a bucket of water on you if you keep it up. She was only half paying attention to the boys when she entered, but when she saw the three boys in a circle with an ugly looking book, her face lit up. What are you dorks doing? Playing ghost hunter again, she laughed. Just leave, Amber. Tell mom we'll be quiet, but don't bug us. It's a tour for certain s whatever loser. You guys aren't even doing it right. You get that book from that same creepy guy. You know he tried to sell my friend Tamara a rock, had the spirit of a great warrior or something stupid like that. She sneered at them. That guy will do anything for a buck. You don't know what you're talking about. Whatever, she said, rolling her eyes and returning to her phone. Just make sure you nerds shut up. She started to leave, closing the door behind her. Yet not before turning off the lights, submerging the room in darkness. With a cackle, she walked away. Perhaps his sister was a witch or something similarly evil. Deep down, though, he knew his sister was right. Mr. Huppe was a nice man, but an aggressive salesperson. There were never that many people in the store whenever Michael visited. Mr. Huppy would always try to upsell when the three of them came. A special crucifix to ward off vampires or a new magical elixir could be added to the purchase. Even at his young age, Michael suspected the demand for an occult store in suburban Toronto wasn't high. Michael sighed and got up to turn the lights back on. However, as he stood up, he noticed the lettering in the books gave a red glow to it, to the point where he could still read. A second woe came from the boys in unison, and Michael continued from where he left off, finding his rhythm quickly. He finished the indication with a sound that sounded more like a cough from a sick person, rather than a word and nothing. The boys looked around, 
No flash of light, no god telling them that it was now at the three boys' bidding. Just the same blue painted walls with Spider-Man posters hanging. Well, glad it wasn't my $325 wasted, Andy said. Tommy, can you turn the lights back on? Michael said, sadness tinging his voice. Sure thing, Tommy got up, flicked the lights, flicked it again, but they wouldn't turn on. Think your bulb's dead, Mikey. Michael sighed again. Hang on, I'll open the curtain. He walked over to his window and pulled them back. It was dark outside. An unusual blackness filled his vision. He looked at the scene, puzzled. It was only 6 p.m. the last time he checked, and there should be light right at the start of summer. Not this inky blackness, as though a veil was over the... All three boys turned towards the door as a scream filled their ears. It came from down the hallway. Michael's heart was pounding, pulsating all the way up into his brain. What was that? Andy stammered. Neither boy responded, simply stood looking at the door. Another scream occurred, followed by a crash. A quietness befell the room. Only the inconsistent breathing of the three boys could be heard. Then Tommy spoke. Mitch Michael, you gotta see what that is. What? Why me? It's your house? Come on, man. It's probably your sister pranking us. Andy piled on. Michael recalled the time he and his friends had tried to capture ghost voices in the basement, and his sister had turned the electricity off and put a chair to block the door. She had recorded their screams of desperation and uploaded them online to the delight of all their friends. He gulped, realizing he wasn't going to get help from his friends and went to leave. Opening the door, he saw the hallway was as dark as his room. He grabbed one of the emergency flashlights his mother had put on the hallway table, taking cautious steps forward, the floorboards creaking under his weight. Had they always done that? Surely they must have. Mom? Dad? He said, his voice trembling. He moved the flashlight around to see nobody. Amber, if this is a joke, it's not funny. He walked up to his sister's room, its door partly ajar. He pushed it open. Amber, where are you? The room felt off. It had a weird smell that reminded him of when he broke his nose skateboarding. The odor hung in the air, seeping into his mouth. It was like little fine particles of metal were hovering all around him. He walked to the other side of the room and looked out the window again. His sister had let it open, and now a thick fog was coming in from outdoors. He stuck his head out the window. The darkness and the deafening quiet that had overcome the neighborhood was disturbed. There were no cars, no more kids playing, no yard work, only silence. He turned his head to see movement. It was hard to tell, but it looked like something was moving. Something attached to the house was slinking around all corners of the house, surrounding it like a vine scarcely discernible, only by how it parted the mist, moving ever closer to him. He slammed the window and left the room. Mom, Dad, where are you guys? He asked the empty space, his voice quivering. As though responding, a creaking noise came from downstairs. He carefully walked towards the noise, taking one step down and holding tightly onto the handrail, trying to discern any shapes in the dark. Mom, Dad, he called out again. He made his way downstairs and walked through the first floor, but he could not find either parent or hear them. They went out, he told himself. Me, Tommy, and Andy were being too noisy, so they went out. A plausible excuse, but his parents always stayed around when he had his friends over. He opened the door, shining the flashlight across the exterior, illuminating nothing. He made to take a step outside, putting his right foot out. With no shoes on, he could feel the coldness of the area, like a late October night. The coldness spread through his body, numbing him. Hesitantly, he stuck his foot out even more, hoping to find the stone step at the base of the door. Yet all his foot found was air. Suddenly, he could feel his weight come forward, like when walking down a set of stairs, expecting one final step only to find it was not there. He wavered back and forth, trying to keep his balance and not tip over. He grabbed both sides of the doorframe, losing his flashlight in the process as it hit the bottom of the door, then tumbled down. Michael watched in horror as the flashlight didn't roll onto the bottom stone step. Instead, it kept falling as though he dropped it from some great height. The beam of light illuminated no ground, only more fog for several seconds until it was completely smothered. He looked at where the flashlight disappeared, shocked. Had they been transported to the top of some mountain? 
then why all the darkness, a cacophony of thoughts swirled around until great noise came from above him, like an aeroplane passing overhead but much closer. Michael looked up, a shape was coming over the top of him, massive in stature, taller than the house, maybe even three times the height, but oval-shaped and thin, like a dying star it emitted its own red glow, which punched through the foggy blackness. Its skin was black, if skin was the right word for it. From that skin, long black tentacles floated all around it, uncountable in number, like the hair on top of someone's head. The shape moved over and in front of him. Hovering some distance away, something in Michael's brain started to give like staring into a black hole that was sucking all the sanity away from him. Perhaps later, he would tell someone that what he had seen was beyond description. For now, though, his brain was too able to process what was in front of him. Three eyes stared back at him, stacked on top of each other, the middle one being the size of a truck. They blinked, and a wet slapping noise echoed through the void when they did. The pupils, themselves a velvety black in a sea of white, focused on him, and something in the back of his mind went away. His breath quickened, and his throat dried. No, 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 his brain screamed. That's not real. That's not there. It can't be there. I must be going crazy. More of those long black hairs, more than he originally thought, an impossible amount, emerged from all around the oval monster. They were making their way toward him and surrounding him. He could see in the glow of the monster that there were more black vines on this side of the house too. They too were getting closer. What if the blackness that surrounded this house was not the darkness that had befallen them? Instead, what if it was the being's appendages wrapping around, encompassing everything, blocking out all external light in an infinite stream of its sinewy darkness? He had to ignore this thought as he reeled himself backwards, collapsing on his backside in a breathless whimper. None of it had ever been true. Nothing they had ever done before had worked, but now they were God knows where with that thing out there. Warm tears started to run down his cheek as the helplessness set in. He wanted to stay there for as long as it took for him to wake up from this obvious nightmare. He would have done that if not for the blood-curdling scream from upstairs. In the chaos of what he saw, he had completely forgotten about Tommy and Andy, now the last two people he was in this house with. He ran upstairs and barged open the door to find a chaotic scene. The red glow from the book filled the room as long black veiny ropes invaded, coming in through the walls and the windows. Though they did not break the wall, it was as though they formed around the limbs like the house was permeable. They thrashed around, knocking posters, toys and his TV to the ground. Michael, help! Tommy screamed as one of the tentacles attached to his leg was pulling him to the window. He tugged on the carpet, trying to claw his way away, but it was too quick. With a violent rip, like pulling a cord on a lawnmower, the inky extremity retraced Tommy back to the wall with a loud thud. He screamed in pain. The window crashed open as the black arm ripped his body through. Tommy's scream became ever more distant to Michael as his shape disappeared in the blackness, just like the flashlight. Michael had no time to think about this as another voice cried. H help! It was Andy's turn now. A tentacle had wrapped around his body, pulling him under the bed. He had been able to grab onto a dresser. Toys and Lego scattered to the floor with a violent crash. Michael could see the tension in the thing's limb as it pulled. The appendage pulsated and stretched as inky ichor dropped off it like sweat. The smell attached itself to Michael, a rotting aroma similar to meat left on a counter overnight. Michael lunged for his friend, grabbing onto his hand. He pulled back, drove his feet downward, and marched back as though he were playing tug-of-war in gym class. For a second, it seemed like they were winning this nightmarish game. That was until a whooshing noise came from the broken opening. What appeared was a giant white disc with a black center that expanded and contracted. It looked at them, and Michael could make out suspicion in its glance. Confusion over what was taking so long, the eye narrowed on Michael, and he was sure his heart would stop simply by the creature's gaze. His whole body started sweating, and his hands started to slip. Don't let go, don't let go, Andy bellowed, but it was too late. Michael fell backwards with a thump and heard the final screams of his friend. Michael, Andy screamed as the monster claimed his prize, dragging him into the darkness under the bed. One final Michael was the last thing he heard. 
he sat there for a second, still staring at that grotesque eyeball. Now satisfied with its victory, the eye widened, then started to move away. Michael had no time to wonder about this as those long veins from the wall started slowly advancing on him. He looked at the book, now glowing brighter than ever, casting a red glow all over the room. He got to his feet, grabbed it, and ran into the bathroom connected to his room. The book caused it. It can fix it. He told himself, his voice shaky and uncertain. He turned through the pages, which were even more saturated, to the point they left a warm, wet imprint on his hand. Quickly, he found the spell he had used. To his surprise, more wording had appeared on the page, a language he could actually read. Warning to those that use this ritual, binding to an elder god comes at great risk, with very little reward. Depending on which one accepts, one could find their body a vessel for its will. Transported to its realm as its plaything, suffer permanent enslavement of the soul to madness, or any other horrible atrocity that is not yet discovered. Due to this, it is heavily discouraged to participate in such a ritual. He looked at the book. The slowness with which the warning had appeared almost seemed to mock him, as though it was setting him up for failure right from the beginning. He shook the book, banging it on the table, wanting to rip its pages and curse it. Yet deep down, it was his decision to use it, his excitement, that caused him to rush through it to impress his friends with some expensive book. Now his only hope was the book that had caused it. He turned each page, hoping against all odds that it would have a solution, perhaps a get rid of an evil god and return your lost friend's spell. But no such luck, Sipperol. The best spell he could find for his situation simply read. Nightportation spell will not take you to a place of your choosing. The spell seems to choose at random, from places ranging to the tops of mountain ranges in Asia to the fields of Europe and even the deserts of Africa, no matter the location of the caster. From the testimony of those who have used the spell and survived to detail their stories, all locations provide at least immediate survivability in this realm of existence. Of course, testimony from those transported to other worlds. Times or environments not meant for mortals would be hard to come by. Michael looked at those words. They were far from reassuring, but they were his best hope. He would transport himself out of here. If he survived, he would go back to the shopkeeper and demand, as much as an eleven-year-old could demand of an adult, that he help him get his friends and family back. He would tell him about all the bad things that his book had caused and how it was his fault. He took a deep breath and started chanting the magical formula. It was similar to the previous spell. The words were hard to speak at first, but he soon found himself weaving a coherent pattern and rhyme. Halfway through the guttural speech, something slimy touched the back of his leg. He looked down to see a tentacle protruding from the door, grabbing at his ankle. He tried to pull away, but the strength of the creature's arm was too much. He hung on to the bathroom counter with all his strength as a second suction gripped at his other ankle and pulled. He found himself now parallel to the floor. He screamed as the muscles in his biceps started to stretch. His eyes darted to the book. It was his last chance. He read the words as best he could, focusing all his strength trying to pronounce it. All the time, the monster pulled and his voice started to stretch along with his body. As he reached the final words of the page, he screamed them in a crescendo of anger. They all at once his body flopped onto the ground, not the hard tile floor of a bathroom. Instead, a mix of grass and dirt softened his fall. His ankles were also free of any gripping strength. Only the suction marks of the beast's arm remained breathing heavily. He looked around. The sky was bright with the sun. There were trees, bright green trees in the distance that seemed to wave at him as a gentle breeze caressed his chin. The book had not come with him, something he was thankful for. He laughed. He couldn't stop himself. He felt joy with each holler. He laughed till tears started rolling down his cheek. Then the laughter started to die down, but the tears remained. Soon he found himself curled over, crying. He closed his eyes, hoping that Tommy, Andy, Hell, and even Amber would come through those trees. But he knew they wouldn't. He had to get up and find his way out of wherever he was. He opened his eyes to find a shroud of darkness covering him. Had he fallen asleep? Was it now nighttime? No, that couldn't be it. He couldn't make out the moon, and the hard, dry grass he was resting on was now cold and black. He got up and looked around. 
It wasn't total blackness as a familiar red glow bathed him. While the moon wasn't there, there were three giant white disks stacked on top of each other staring back at him. It didn't take long for the thing to find him. Maybe a godlike being just always knows where you are, especially if you bind to them. It was all he could do to sit there and watch as long snake-like appendages filled his vision. My affection for my wife was beyond words. The moment I first saw her, it was as if Cupid himself had struck my heart with his arrow. Her smile had a profound effect on me, leaving me weak in the knees and struggling to speak clearly. I stumbled over my words in her presence. But she seemed to understand, and instead of ridicule, she extended her hand and introduced herself as Clarisse. The way her name rolled off my tongue felt smooth and elegant. I was completely captivated. She agreed to join me for lunch at Big Pete's Island Grill. As she spoke animatedly, I was content to listen, mesmerized by her striking features. Her almond-shaped, honey-brown eyes sparkled with each laugh, and her fair skin glowed with, re with a classical nose and delicate lips that needed no enhancement. Her natural beauty was stunning, the kind that would make a model envious. I found myself gazing into her eyes, experiencing the true meaning of losing oneself in someone's eyes. Her hair glowed like the warm hues of a summer sunset, seemingly creating a halo around her. I might sound overly infatuated, but I assure you this is all real. She was the epitome of perfection, and I was resolute in my desire to be with her. After dating for six months, I proposed and my heart soared when she accepted. We married three months later, embracing the joy of our inevitable union. We settled into a cozy three-bedroom house with a spacious backyard, envisioning a future with me. She was the light of my life. She would welcome me home with delicious dinners, showcasing her culinary skills. Her roasts were succulent, and her potatoes were whipped to perfection. Each meal was a delight, and I soon noticed the impact of good food and happiness on my physique. I went from 195 Alps to 230 Alps, trading my athletic build for a softer, more relaxed frame. Yet her unwavering love for me only deepened my love for her. On our first anniversary, we discovered we had hit a home run. A home pregnancy test informed us of our impending parenthood. An ultrasound three months later informed us that we were having triplets. I had never been so happy. We spent the next five months preparing for our new arrivals labor and delivery was a long and excruciatingly painful process, but it paid off in a set of girls and one boy. Things couldn't be more perfect. My wife insisted on breastfeeding them until they were three. I thought it odd, but what the heck? She was mom, so she knew best. Even with the three handfuls, she still had my dinner prepared every night, a Herculean feat in my mind. I told her not to worry about me, and she shook her head dismissively. She told me that I was as important to her as I had ever been and that there was no reason for anything to change. If she cooked before, she was going to continue to do so. She said she didn't want me wasting away to skin and bones. I loved her even more for that. When the scale revealed a weight of 275, I became concerned. I hadn't even realized that I had gotten that big. I told Clarisse and she just wrapped her arms around me and told me how much she liked my fluff and how handsome I was. You don't need to lose weight. You just need to change your perspective about your weight. I accepted her theory and continued gobbling down whatever she put in front of me. At the table between forkfuls, I would look across the table and see her staring lovingly at me. I could see she was pleased and that made me want to please her even more. That's when I would ask for seconds. Three years later, according to my wife, our kids are now ready for solid food. I was kind of excited and looking forward to the first time we all sat down together for dinner. My wife treated it like the special occasion it was. A gold cloth was draped across the table. Our best dinner and flatware graced each of the five places. I sat at the head surrounded by my beautiful family. The girls were miniature replicas of my wife and my son was the male version of her. I stood, raised my crystal goblet and toasted my family. My wife raised hers in return. When I woke up, I was naked lying secure to the table with leather straps. I looked around in confusion, my gaze settling on Clarice. What's going on? What is this? I told you the kids were ready for solid food, didn't I? What? 
I saw my children, their eyes focused on their mother. I watched Clarice nod her head in my direction. I watched the heads of those three little innocents swivel in my direction. I couldn't quite identify their expressions, but it looked a lot like hunger. I watched as they climbed onto the table. My daughter sat on either side of me, my son at my head. He stared into my eyes, then looked up at his mother. She uttered one word, eat. I watched as their baby teeth elongated and sharpened into points. Pain raced through my side as my daughters bit deep into my flesh. Blood dripped from the corners of their mouths as they chewed, savoring their first real taste of meat. My wife stood silently watching. She was salivating. I felt another piercing pain as another chunk of flesh was ripped from my body. I screamed and looked down. One of my daughters was still chewing. The other was licking blood from the open wound. I lifted my eyes to see my son looking down at me. But tented, he smiled his mouth full of teeth as sharp as his sister's. It wasn't the innocent, delighted smile of a toddler. It was the twisted grin of a creature with a voracious appetite. He opened his mouth wider than should have been possible for a child his age and bit down on my head. The crunch of bone sounded through the air. Blood ran down past my ears and pooled on the table below. In my last moments of consciousness, I saw my wife come and stand beside my son and stare into my slowly closing eyes. She had been fattening me up and preparing me to be our children's first meal even before they were born and I never suspected a thing. She leaned forward to get her share. When she lifted her head, I could see bits of flesh stuck between her teeth as she chewed. Her mouth and chin was smeared with my blood. They fed. The sounds of flesh being ripped from bone and slurping as pools of blood were lapped up from the table filled my ears. The last thing I saw before sliding into death's embrace was the faces of Clarice and the children. Sated, their eyes were slightly glazed and they were covered in blood. The jagged teeth were gone but evidence of their recent meal remained. The last thing I heard was the childlike giggles as they cooed softly. Thank you, Daddy. Clearly, I did not know Clarice as well as I thought and I not knowing what she or our offspring were and it really didn't matter. My love for her and them remained unchanged. If my life had to be traded to ensure the continuation of theirs, then it was a sacrifice I was more than happy to make. I don't like people very much. And for a variety of personal reasons, most people don't like me either. To emphasize how much I dislike being around others, I recently bought a new house that is so far back from the road that my closest neighbor is at least a mile and a half away. That's right, just me and nothing but animals and trees in every direction. Many people would call me crazy if I lived in the middle of nowhere like that. I know that if some disaster were to happen, I would be completely fucked. But I'm at an age now where I don't think I care. At least I used to. I'm such an idiot. After leaving the town, I used to live in around 7 in the morning. It was at least mid-afternoon when I finally dragged my beat-up truck and the few belongings I owned down the curvy road to my new residence, like a monstrous snake of earth and gravel cutting through a dense pine forest. This driveway was about a third of a mile long and full of rocks and potholes, and I was sure I was going to get stuck on it. But thanks to an amazing coincidence, I managed to avoid calling a tow truck. The trees and greenery finally parted, revealing a clearing with a modest house in the center. I stepped out of my pickup, slamming the door behind me and causing a few birds to scatter from their nearby hiding spots among the thick and tangled pine trees. With gravel crunching underfoot, I walked around to the back of the truck and began unloading. Now, I said, I didn't have many possessions. This is true. Regardless of this fact, it still took me about six hours getting it all unloaded. The furniture was the hardest part. Damn near broke my back dealing with the armchair. But like I said, I don't do company well, and this includes people for moving assistance. I groaned aloud as I stretched a bit, wiping sweat from my brow as I cast my gaze up toward the setting sun. It was a loud crack that echoed deep in the forest. It must have been pretty damn loud because I could hear it clearly even at this far distance. That's a damn serious tree branch right there. I said to myself, looking in the direction it seemed to be coming from, the forest was so dense that visibility dropped off at about 50 feet, replaced by twisted branches and darkness. It didn't help that the sun was halfway to setting, which made eerie shadows stretch across the clearing toward my house. Despite all this, I focused my eyes on the spot. A deer? 
or maybe a bear. At some point, I realized that for some ridiculous reason, I was holding my breath, taking a long exhale. Just as I was turning toward the stairs leading to my porch, I heard it again, another loud crack coming from the darkness of the forest. I turned around to look at it, but there was nothing there again. Is he going to jump on the damn branches now? I asked myself, laughing as I finally tore my gaze away from the forest and walked into the hut, closing the intricately carved wooden door behind me. Standing on the threshold, I looked around my new home with a smile. It really was a beautiful place. It had an old rustic feel to it that resonated with all the classic mountain vibes I was looking for. It was even equipped with some pretty modern appliances and had some nice floodlights with moving lights on the outside. And I got all this for next to nothing. Admittedly, I didn't feel like unpacking too much after all that heavy lifting, so the majority of my possessions would remain in this room for now, standing up against the wall in neat stacks. I slipped my work boots off and moved on into the kitchen to make myself some dinner. Well, Idner being a couple cups of ramen noodles and a beer. I realized with a groan that I'd have to go into town for some groceries eventually. I went ahead and unpacked the TV and an old rocking chair, setting both objects down in my new living room so I could watch one of the many shitty B-movies I'd brought with me. I was a sucker for goofy horror stuff. I threw open the window next to me for some of that cool air and started digging into my ramen. Crack say, I felt like I almost jumped out of my damn clothes when I heard that. Another crackling branch in the forest, but this time it was closer. Yes, it was definitely closer. I leaned back in my chair, but my eyes were fixed on the forest. Why did it piss me off? The damn forest was full of animals and sticks. There was nothing strange about the fact that from time to time someone clicked. No matter how I tried to convince myself how ridiculous I was acting, I was still looking out the window. It was darker there now, so I had even less chance of seeing anything. That's when I realized how quiet it was here, I mean, apart from the fucking branches. There was not a single bird cry. Maybe they were asleep, I thought, but why weren't the crickets chirping? I began to feel a headache building up in the back of my head. Sweat stood out on my forehead despite the cool air blowing through the window. Okay, then enough of this. I said aloud, getting up from my chair with a grunt, quickly closing the window with a bolt. I began to regret that I hadn't brought curtains with me. I thought I wouldn't need it so far from anyone else, but now I felt unprotected, even vulnerable. But the old dot .22 caliber rifle that I brought here with me provided some solace. I went back to my food, which had started to cool down. Apparently, I had been looking out the window longer than I thought. Some time later, I cleaned up and walked down the hall to my bedroom. It was about 10 p.m., and looking out the window, you could only see an ocean of blackness. It was one of those moonless, starless nights when you feel like you're in space. By this time, my headache had significantly worsened, and I felt that I needed the help of medications to get a good night's sleep. Yes, the drugs are related to my problems with other people. After swallowing the sleeping pills, I climbed onto the bed, which was also in this house. The mattress turned out to be surprisingly much more comfortable than I thought. It won't be long before I fall asleep again, one of those long, dreamless dreams that I've been so used to lately. Not for long at all. Crack, for only... I sat up, looking around to the right and left, but I was not greeted by the cozy walls of my bedroom. Only a dark, silent forest stretched in all directions. If it weren't for the flashlight, I wouldn't have seen anything. Where did this lantern come from? Once again, that damn sound pierced the nothingness like a knife. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. Panic began to grip my insides as if I were choking on ice water. I had to get out of here. Crash, I had to run. No, God damn it, no. I screamed as I started running frantically through the forest. Branches reached out from all sides like skinny clawed hands, tearing at my clothes and skin. But I couldn't even begin to care about my physical condition at that time. I knew I just had to get out of there. Snap. Sit behind me. Another one of those god-awful snapping sounds chased me from the dark as it drew closer. What? What was even out there? Damn it! What was it? My head felt like it was going to burst and I was absolutely covered in scrapes and I almost fall and split my skull open on a rock I didn't see, but caught myself at the last moment. Crack. 
The noises were increasing in frequency and volume. I realized it was getting closer. Tears stung my eyes as I cried out into the darkness, as if this would stave off the futility of my situation. But just when I thought all hope was lost, I broke free from the woods into a familiar clearing. Yes, yes, I yelled. I'd made it home. I just have to get inside, just have to... What I see in the clearing isn't my house. With a dim light my lantern provides, I see a tree, a massive tree, so the trunk stretches high into the sky, and its many leafless branches look like the arms of some sort of colossal upside-down insect, its twisted legs attempting to pluck the very moon from the sky. I'm transfixed by the sight, absolutely dumb snap. The horrible sound from mere feet behind me had pulled my mind back into focus. But I know it's pointless to run now. I stand there, rooted to the ground just like the tree before me. I didn't want to see what it is, like the mere sight of it will cause me harm. I refuse to turn around. I just wanted it to be over with, clenching my hands into fists. I shut my eyes tightly, waiting for the white-hot pain of an early death to tear through me. Then I woke up. Drenched in sweat, I opened my eyes to see the ceiling in my room. God damn. I'd said with a croak as I practically threw the sheets off of me. Rolling out of bed, I staggered into the kitchen to pour myself a glass of ice water. It felt so good, soothing my raw vocal cords. Had I been screaming in my sleep too, those meds were supposed to keep that from happening. I thought as I rubbed my hand down my face. And why did that dream feel so real? Till that tree. I felt like I'd seen it before. It finally dawned on me after a few minutes of silent contemplation. I turned toward the back door, opening it after more hesitance than I probably needed. The backyard was expansive, surrounded by woods on all sides except the one facing my house. A few small trees dotted the lawn here and there, but smack dab at its center was a gigantic tree stump. The thing had to be at least 10 or 11 feet wide by my count. I'd seen this in one of the pictures that had advertised the house on the website I found it on. Apparently, most of the wood that made up my cabin came from this thing. I walked across the lawn, letting the cool morning air soothe my still very warm body until I stopped a few feet away from the stump, looking down at it. Well, this stump was certainly a lot more dead than the tree in my nightmare, but the width of it seemed spot on. Having such a god-awful dream on the first night in my dream home seemed pair for the course with my luck. I turned and trudged my way back inside, but not before taking one last look at the woods toward the very back of my yard. It was midday after an uneventful morning passed, and I decided that maybe I would just bite the bullet and head into town for those groceries. And curtains, I grimly reminded myself. The whole way there, I just kept looking into the woods on either side of my path. And when I rolled over a branch, the snapping noise it caused damn near made me swerve off the road those damn woods. I took a breath to calm myself. It's a dream. You'll love it here, I said. The drive took about 40 minutes or so total, but I could probably cut the time down after I remove all those rocks and fill in the potholes. So the transition from dirt and gravel into pavement marked my arrival into the small pocket of civilization that was the town. Toward the center was a small shopping center that pretty much held all of the businesses here. I found myself a parking spot and went inside. I walked through the sliding doors of the grocery store, past the only employee stationed at the checkout area. Looked like an older woman, her hair tied up in a messy gray bun. She had thick glasses that really gave her an elderly librarian sort of look. I hoped to God she wasn't chatty. After about 20 minutes of walking around on old and yellowed floor tile, I'd amassed a fairly decent haul of items. I figured it was time to check out, so I turned and started down the somewhat claustrophobic aisle when a snapping sound from behind caused me to come to a dead stop. Here, there's no way, no way, just no way. I hear myself choking out. I whipped my head around so fast it could have broken my neck, but to my intense relief I just see another employee. He was using a box cutter to break plastic straps that held a I stared for a moment before a laugh slipped its way out involuntarily, causing the guy to look my way in confusion. Realizing I probably looked crazy for doing so, I promptly turned and walked the rest of the way to the front. The elderly woman behind the checkout counter offered me a smile, and I did the best to return the gesture, but it just felt awkward and forced as usual. Haven't seen your face before, new in town? She asks me. Inwardly, I groaned. 
Yep, there's the question. I attempted to answer her as cheerfully as I could muster. Yeah, uh, just moved in yesterday, actually. She nodded as she continues to scan my items. I wished she'd scan them faster. She spoke up again. I can always tell I got an eye for faces. Whereabouts are you located, anyway? I blink a few times. Moved into a place up the dirt road, the new cabin, I said before my brain knows what it's doing. Why did I say all that? Could have just made something up. Well, she's just some old lady anyway, I figured. I broke out of my train of thought when I realized she'd fixed me with a strange expression, her prior demeanor having melted away. She would then wordlessly hand me my last bag and I took it from her, confused. Had I offended her somehow? Typical. In the end, I let out an awkward half-laugh before opting to leave with a quick goodbye. The drive home was done in complete silence. Upon getting home, I began to hurriedly throw curtains up over all the windows. I tried to tell myself it was just for the sake of privacy, but that was a thinly veiled excuse at best. Only after blocking my view of the forest completely did I prepare dinner. I put on some music and even sang along to it, trying to block out any other potential outside sounds. More time passed and it was eventually 8 p.m. The sun was well into setting. I could see only a faint bit of light slipping in from between the curtains in my living room. I sat down into my armchair that I'd unpacked a few hours ago, sighing and watching some of that mind-numbing TV. At some point I guess I'd slipped into an unwanted nap, because the next thing I knew I'm jolted awake once again by, by, well, by the TV I'd left on, I'd so conveniently decided. Looking at it, my watch I saw it was 12 a.m. Great, I'd ruined my sleep schedule with a four-hour nap. With a groan, I rose from my chair and fumbled my way down the dark hallway to my room. I'd figured that after last night, I should try two pills instead of one this time. This way, I'll be out like a light for sure. I'd taken both, slipping into bed and rolling onto my side to see my now curtained window through the gloomy darkness of my room. Twenty minutes pass, and I'm really starting to feel those pills taking effect. That familiar fuzzy feeling in my brain was setting in and I was. An edge enter. My drooping eyes open wide, bloodshot. My gaze is locked on the window. It was out there in my yard. I just knew it was. Inwardly, I fought with myself to rise from my bed and walk over to the curtains. I had to know. If I knew, I'd stop being so afraid. It's just a damn wild animal. Just an animal. Just an animal. Just an animal. I whispered as I pulled the curtain aside just enough to peek through. It was dark out there dark enough that the meager moonlight only allowed vague silhouettes to reveal themselves, had to look around around for a moment before I finally spotted. Toward the center of the clearing stood a familiar shape, a deer. No, a bit too big. I decided that it's an elk, but it was just so hard to see that all I got was a dark elk-shaped blob. I could make out its tall, lanky legs and its huge set of branching antlers that sprouted atop its head. I sighed in relief, grinning to myself for being such a baby about all this. I'd begun to look away when another snap from outside caused me to turn back around in confusion. What was it stepping on to make those noises? I cleared my yard pretty well this morning. I continued to watch it curiously, but I could feel those pills taking effect more and more with each passing second. After about a minute of watching the thing, it finally dawned on me. Didn't I have motion lights? Why weren't they on? Actually, had this thing moved at all since I started watching it? I attempted to swallow, but my throat was dry. I kept watching it. Another minute passes, then two more. Please, just fucking move. Please, I said hopelessly. But it just stands there in the dark like a statue, like something fake. God damn it. Why wasn't it moving? It was wrong. Everything about this was just so wrong, I decided. A noise catches my attention, a soft creaking noise coming from the elk, the F.I. thing. It grew in intensity until... Crack. Its antlers. Its goddamn antlers. They twitched, then cracked and shifted like those insect-like tree limbs I'd dreamt of, like someone breaking an arm out of place in multiple angles, like... Crack antler shift again and crack again a few more times. I shut the curtains quickly to block it from view, but the memory of it is burnt into my mind. It was dark in my room. It didn't see me, it couldn't have seen me. Please, God, don't let it have seen me, I thought. I'd just end up sitting there on the floor under the window, panting and sweating, waiting for something to happen. 
but even with this fresh fear coursing through me, I could feel those pills fighting to put me under. Swarning up at the clock on my bedside table, I started counting the passage of time. 12.45 a.m. and two in Troyd. 4.50 a.m. in 12.5 a.m. Mine finally out around this time, I think, but I have that same horrible dream and I wake up screaming in the morning from my very uncomfortable spot on the floor. I was relieved to see that there was light streaming in through the curtains. I got up, stiff from my unfortunate sleeping location, and threw them open to reveal an empty backyard with that massive stump at its center. That thing was standing on that stump, wasn't it? No, no it wasn't, I stubbornly thought. There wasn't anything there. That was all, just some sleeping pill-fueled hallucination. This whole thing has just been in my head like everything always is what an idiot I was. Regardless of how much I tell myself it didn't happen, I only went outside once to get the mail down at the end of my driveway. Otherwise, I was shut up in my cabin with the music blaring. I really liked this music. I dug out some books that I hadn't touched since buying. I put on a movie only to realize halfway through that I'd watched it the day I moved in. Something kept distracting me. The thought of that thing I saw through my window but I just as quickly reminded myself that it wasn't possible. This was reality, not some nightmare. The worst things in these woods were bears, and even then they won't go out of their way to kill you. My attempts at reassuring myself were useless and I could feel my anxiety growing as the hours slipped by. At around 6 p.m. I decided to shower and I stayed in there for about an hour. Yeah, a hit to the water bill, but I really needed it. I actually did feel a bit better afterwards too slipping into bed after changing, I sat there in silence. I figured that I'd forgo the sleeping pills to prove to myself that all of this was just the side effects of some faulty drugs and I'd end up getting a lot of money for financial compensation or some sh Yeah, they were supposed to keep me from having shitty dreams, but the last two were worse than anything I'd ever dreamt before. And I wasn't about to go through that a third time. I stared at the clock, watching the time tick forward and internally on high alert for any totally not real noises, but I didn't hear anything. Only the usual forest sounds of crickets. I slid further under the covers and let sleep take me, for better or worse. Why hadn't I just taken the damn pills? I woke up, startled awake by rapid thudding footsteps coming down my hall. It was here, here in my fucking house. How? How? I just kept asking myself how as I scrambled toward the edge of my bed, toward the wall that had my 22 mounted on it. But it, my door flew open. But what stepped in wasn't the thing outside my window. It was a man in dark clothes. Yes, someone had broken in. I froze in my tracks as I noticed he had a gun pointed at me. Don't you fucking move. He yelled at me and I flinched from the volume. I complied, remaining stationary. L, look, I don't have much to steal, you E, I tried to say, but I'm cut off by another scream from the intruder. Shut the fuck up or I'll blow your brains out, Seamair. He gestured to me with a weapon, and I reluctantly did as he commanded, walking towards the open door. Why was my luck so shit? I get over these nightmares just to be confronted with a very real situation. He'd forced me out ahead of him, into the adjacent living room down the hall. Stand right fucking there, he said, and I did so. I stood there silently for almost 15 seconds. What was this? Was he thinking about what to do with me? A sharp blow to the back of my head with his gun answered that question. I fell to the floor, hitting my head again on its cool surface. The whole world just started spinning. They had my eyes on this place for a few days. He told me, walking around my crumbled form. I could feel a warm trail running down the back of my head from where he'd hit me. You should really start locking your doors. Damn it, I'd been so scatterbrained yesterday I forgot even that much. This guy had really taunted me about it too, the goddamn asshole. Couldn't he just steal all my shit and get it over with? He had been about to hit me again, I think, when it happened. Crack, that noise, it came suddenly and loudly. Even in my dazed state, I could feel the fear bubbling up. My attacker apparently heard it too, which meant it was real. It had always been real. What was that? He asked aloud, looking down to me. You got someone living here with you, huh? I shook my head as best as I could manage, but another snap from outside drew his attention again. Yeah, you do. Fucking liar. He spat out at me. He angrily marched his way down the hall, wood creaking under his shoes as he barged out through the back door and into the darkness, bellowing loudly. Hey, don't move or I'll shoot your... 
The motion sensor lights snap on like they were designed to do. They hadn't been wrongly installed or faulty, of course. The only wrong thing in this situation was that thing, outside. From my angle on the floor, I couldn't see the man anymore, just the illumination cast into the room by those bright lights outside. I heard the dumbfounded confusion in the man's voice, his absolute lack of understanding at what he no doubt saw standing in the middle of my yard. What the fuck? He'd said, snap, 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 snap. Then the screaming began. First in terror, sheer, unadulterated terror. I heard him running back to the house, screaming like that the whole way. The snapping and cracking was maddening, like whatever out there was excited to see that pitiful man. The shark smelling blood is what came to my mind at the time. His screams shifted almost instantly to those of agony, and he began to beg for his life. The sound of his voice was being rapidly moved from place to place outside, as if he were being thrown about by some great force. I struggled with all my might to get to my feet, and finally did so. Moving down toward the open back door, I had to fight against all my instincts that were telling me to flee right then and there. As I reached the door, I shut my eyes. I didn't want to see it. I thought I did before, but now I knew without a doubt in my mind that I absolutely must not see it. A few warm droplets splash across my face right before I slam the door shut, locking it. Cracking, like someone bending a bundle of twigs until they all broke at the middle. I turned and frantically sprinted to my front door, the door that the would-be robber had probably come through. Finding it unlocked told me this hunch was true, and I promptly locked that door as well. Turning again to my back door, I now only realized that the screaming from outside still hadn't stopped. It had only grown more intense. I could hear vague words and phrases. His pleading had devolved into what sounded borderline deranged. He apologized over and over to his dad, his mom, others I could only assume he knew. At one point, his screaming turned into hideous laughter, only to return to screaming minutes later. Even when blood filled his lungs, even when his vocal cords were shredded, he kept screaming, why wasn't he dead? How wasn't he dead? I felt absolute sorrow for this man, and he'd beat me over the head and tried to rob me only minutes earlier. Snapping, like someone breaking every bone in their body, how can I most accurately describe the sounds he made? Maybe like a guy who'd fallen into a wood chipper feet first, but if his death was played out in slow motion. The man outside my house screamed like this for an hour and a half. I know this for a fact, because all I could do the whole time was stare across the room at the clock on the wall. What else could I have done besides sit and listen? The snapping noises of the thing outside and what I assumed were the man's bones being broken just blended together. Finally, mercifully, the screaming tapered off into a pitiful gurgling whine and then silence. I sat there. I just kept sitting there, not moving. Not even to get up and clean my head wound. I sat until the sun had long since risen. And when I finally got up, it felt like my body was made of jelly. I walked to the bathroom, looking into the mirror. What had felt like warm rain on my face when I'd been at the door earlier was made out to be speckles of blood that had long since dried. After frantically cleaning it all off in the sink, I left the room, then looked to the back door. Walking to it made me feel like I was on the moon. Everything was in slow motion. This couldn't have been real, I pointlessly thought. I finally pushed it open after what felt like a million years it came and went. It had been real. It had all been real, of course, what I saw. I'll never forget all the drugs in the world won't dull that scene. Strewn about my yard was the man. Yes, I'm sure that was him all over the place. The grass was stained red, and looking to the side of my house revealed it was painted a similar color. There was meat everywhere, organs, fractured bones stabbed vertically into the earth. But the bones were so white, so clean. I doubled over and puked up the remnants of last night's dinner, warm bile and snot coated my mouth and nose and left me choking for breath as I sputtered. Raising my head again, I noticed something else in the middle of all this carnage. The tree stump had grown into a tree again. It was alive again, significantly shorter than the one in my dreams, but still definitely a tree. In the twisted branches of that tree hung the man's intestines, draped from branch to branch like f across the front of the broad, dark trunk, facing my house, lay his skin. It had been so intricately removed from his body that I could practically see the expression of frozen agony on its stretched face. The day went by in a blur and it's almost night again. I don't know what to do. 
I can't call the fucking police about this. What do I tell them? That someone broke into my house and then, then what? They carefully disassembled themselves and posed their body parts in my backyard. This is the kind of thing people get executed for, I imagine. My track record isn't the best to begin with. I decided it was best to just clean it up to hide it all and pretend it never happened. It's hard getting several meters worth of guts out of a tree, especially when you stop to puke every five minutes. And I'll need to buy a power washer for my walls. But I realized something else while I was out there, cleaning that asshole up off my lawn. And this horrible thought only solidified into truth when I heard the increasingly close snapping of branches out in the woods a few minutes ago. That tree doesn't look like it's finished growing yet. There is a statue that my family has owned and cared for for many centuries. It is supposed to be a relative of some kind who helped create our family's wealth through forgotten means and helped found the regional government. Whatever significance this important figure once had is now forgotten, yet the statue still remains. The statue is still passionately appreciated. Half of my family is obsessed with it for reasons I cannot understand. This half of the family believes it has a hereditary gene for mental illness, while the other half, the one I side with, is accused by the same half of having the same illness. A mental illness that has been passed down for generations, just like this strange statue of a man that none of us know or have known. I should add that it is a strange thing and will underscore my point about my family's excessive care and attention to it. I should say that the crucifixes in the villa are neglected Yet this statue, this stone man, is cared for as if he were alive, as if the stone itself were bone and skin and muscle and flesh. They cared for it as if it were a child, washed it, decorated it, let me be frank, almost worshipped it. For years, this obsession-like madness continued, bringing the statue to private events and family parties, as if the colorless inanimate in its eyes could see the events and take pleasure in them. I swear I was waiting for one of my relatives, perhaps my dear aunt or crazy uncle, to bring a sandwich to her face as a child does to a doll. However, nothing so ridiculous ever happened. Over the years, I noticed something peculiar about the statue's face one evening, when my eyes were heavy and my glass full of wine. I noticed that the face had aged. I don't mean that it had aged the way stone generally ages, with its fractures and weathering its crumbling, none of that. No, I mean that he had aged as a man ages, his hairline receding, his face looking wrinkled. How can this be? Not wanting to hear any criticism or ridicule from my family, I hid this observation from them and later even hid the statue from their eyes. Before I knew it, I too was afflicted with this madness. I would study its surface and observe it in private for hours, repairing every imperfection and keeping it immaculate. It wasn't long before I realized that I had become its main guardian, in fact, its only guardian. What a prison sentence I imposed on myself. What an unwritten curfew I imposed on myself. The perimeters, the limits, the time devoted to this lifeless rock. Lifeless, or so I thought. When I was the only one left of my intimate family and the last individual living in the manor, I was left alone with the statue. I swear I could hear it running at night, its heavy weight crashing onto my property always outside my door, daring me to go out or invite it in. I know how it sounds, but it's true. And I know better than to ever invite evil in. Evil cannot access our souls, our safe domains, anywhere, unless we allow it. So we must stay strong. I, I must stay strong. As further time passed, I could not bear the burden of this secret. I understood why my family was obsessed with this thing, because it was alive. I wished to rid myself of it, but I dared not destroy it. Maybe it wanted to be destroyed, to set whatever evil was inside free. I know better than that I will not unleash it from its stone cell. It cannot fool me. So I began to donate many works of art my family owned, hoping to one day develop the strength to banish the statue eventually. Just as I donated many of the works of art of the property simultaneously to different universities, hospitals and other institutions. My actions were done in fear which I disguised publicly as generosity. A generosity that caught the attention of a prestigious doctor and his gorgeous daughter who is my age and was a pioneering scholar. Very different from many of the women I know, she was special. We soon met at a charity event and the woman whose name is Elizabeth was present. 
I wooed her appropriately, and my efforts won me the luxury of an eventful evening with her on many occurrences. One such occurrence stands out from all the others, and that is because of what transpired. It had been a long evening of wine and romance, and if I'm being honest, some minor opioids. I was awoken from a dream into a nightmare as I heard the stone man at my door. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't. The madness of my ancestors overwhelmed me, the fear, it consumed me, and I frantically yelled uncontrollably. I could not refrain. In doing so, I terrified poor Elizabeth, who was by then my fiance. She then demanded I escort her home despite the hour. I did no such thing, however, and she threatened to delay our wedding and to tell the authorities that I had held her there against her will, as though it was a kidnapping or a false arrest holding her there without her continued consent. I know I saved her, but she must have not believed me. I never saw her again, but her involvement in my life did not end that night. She had shamelessly told my remaining and distant family of what occurred that night and of my reactions. At first, she blamed the opium, saying it elevated my sensitivity and had made me illusional. Yet I know this to be false. I was not a stranger to the vice. She then therefore blamed my actions on an afflicted and ailing mind. I knew it would not be long before they would come after me. I knew of her influence over her psychiatric hospital director of a father and his influence on the local police. They would all conspire against me. Elizabeth through letters claimed she was only trying to help me and that she wanted me to get well and would see me again once I recovered. But I am well, well enough to know her tricks and well enough to finally rid myself of the stone man and so I finally donated him away. To where I did not know, I did not care. I wanted it to be random and anonymous. That way, I could not change my mind and request it back and also so my family could not reclaim it. Yet somehow, for reasons I still do not, yet fully understand, my family had me committed to an insane asylum. It was either to spite me for banishing that demonic idol from our historic home, or as a strategy to secure my parents' money and claim the remainder of my inheritance as their own. They claim I am suffering from paranoia, from wondrous illusions. They theorized it is from the strain of solitude or the misfortune of genetic traits passed down. Hell if they know, I know the truth. Now I write this from the asylum's library, and I have only arrived here weeks ago. On the day of my arrival, I was given a room in a square building with a courtyard in the center. My room faces the inside of the courtyard, and from my barred window, I can see beyond the courtyard and peer into the rooms across the way. That is where I found it. There can be no mistake, the stone man that haunts me. At first, I thought perhaps I was crazy and imagining its presence here, I thought, maybe I was rightfully committed. Now I know I'm not. I begged for an explanation and was told that it was the art therapy room and that the statue was an anonymous donation. I naturally declared myself the donor and politely requested that they move it from my sight, but they laughed and mocked me in disbelief and my request was denied. So it has begun again, that damned statue. It moves during the middle of the night, I know it. It wants its vengeance on me for abandoning it to the confines of this place. No longer does it dwell amongst blossoming gardens or amongst festive parties and ballroom dances. Now you could say, or perhaps ask, how can I be so sure? Well, perhaps I just cannot perceive its exact locations through the thickness of the night and through its heavy darkness. But no, oh no, I know it's acting up again. I found pebbles and rock on the other side of my doorway. It knows I am here. The guards explain it away, saying it's the lack of funding that the building is old and falling apart. As for the statue, well, every morning when the dawn arrives, there it is, back in its original position in the window, staring at me, I tell you, staring unflinchingly without emotion, without expression. It's cold, ugly silhouette always in that forsaken window. I've had enough and I know my time is short. This building is too small for both of us. It must know that as well. It's either him or me, the ancient relic of my bloodline, or me, the future of it. The legacy lays in only one of our hands, and I'll be dead before I let that legacy be clutched by hands of stone rather than hands of flesh and bone. I have stolen the key from the art room when I was on janitorial duties today. The attendant did not realize. They were too preoccupied with their flirtations with the nurse of the floor. Now is the time to strike. 
If somehow I do not make it through with my task, you will know why and what. I promise you, although I cannot explain this entirely, I know I'm not crazy. It is no wonder my family worshipped this thing, this cursed thing, because they also knew and they feared it, as I have feared it for the last time. Farewell for now, dear readers. Dear Mrs. Elizabeth Livingston, I write to you from Old Doc Mental Asylum. I am in charge of the state's mental hygiene and property police force at this location. I regret to inform you of the passing of your former fiancé, the late Mr. John Swansong. In his will, he insisted that you were to be corresponded with at once and be given letters he personally wrote for you during his brief treatment here. His passing was bewildering and sudden to all of us and under bizarre circumstances. On behalf of the asylum staff, you have our deepest sympathies. I must warn you that it was also in the will of his that he explain how he died if he were to do so while committed within these walls. In the morning, when we released the patients for breakfast, we noticed that his room was empty. Mr. Swansong had either somehow escaped or extended his janitorial duties without permission. Either way, shortly after this discovery, we found him in the art therapy room. There seems to have been a freak accident. One may call it an act of God, but I do not believe God was involved, and therefore I shall call it an accident. A large statue that had been previously owned by Mr. Swansong and donated here had collapsed upon him and unfortunately crushed him to death. We believe he was trying to clean it, as he was well known to do. The statue is to be removed from our location and to be delivered to you as he would have wanted someone he trusted to become its caretaker. Peace be with you. Terribly sorry for your loss again. Godspeed. My sincere condolences, Chief Stoneman.